I am so incredibly proud to be part of these awards as they honor the legacy of my mother and bring out the very best in people like you. This week, Harry honors the winners of the Diana Award, William cheers the reopening of English pubs, and Charles celebrates 72 years of the National Health Service. Thank you all for what you have done, more than I can possibly say. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Royal Report, everyone. I'm your host, Sharon Carpenter. It's been another busy week for the Royal Family, so let's get right to the news. Last week, in her ongoing effort to speak with world leaders during the COVID-19 crisis, the Queen had a phone call with President Trump. According to White House spokesman Judd Deere, Her Majesty and the President reaffirmed that the UK and the US stand together in what has long been known as their special relationship and will emerge from this trying time stronger than ever before. On Wednesday, in honor of Canada Day, William and Kate talked via video chat with staff members from Fraser Health Surrey Memorial Hospital in British Columbia. During the call, the royal couple heard about the struggles facing frontline workers and praised their hard work during the global pandemic. Catherine, I just wanted to just touch base and say how proud we are of all of you, everyone on the front line, who have led the way very stoically, very bravely, and um, have put patient care you know, right at the top of the list uh, and have done a fantastic job. That same day, Harry delivered a surprise video message during the virtual ceremony for the Diana Award, which honors young people who have created and sustained a positive social change. On what would have been his mother's 59th birthday, the Duke spoke about the lasting legacy of the People's Princess. I know that my mother has been an inspiration to many of you, and I can assure you, she would have been fighting for your corner. Like many of you, she never took the easy route or the popular one, or the comfortable one. But she stood for something, and she stood up for people who needed it. On Friday, just one day before pubs opened across the UK, William stopped by the historic Rose and Crown in Snettersham, just five miles from Anne Hall. During his 45-minute visit, the Duke enjoyed a glass of local cider while chatting with the pub owners and staff about the challenges they faced during lockdown. On Sunday, Charles shared a heartfelt video message in honor of the 72nd anniversary of the founding of the National Health Service. In his four minute address, the Prince spoke about the organization's historic significance and how vital they've been throughout the pandemic. On July the 5th, 1948, just four months before I was born, Trafford General Hospital opened its doors, providing care to all according to their need not their ability to pay. After more than seven decades, that founding principle, though now familiar, is still a profoundly moving statement of our values, and it has never been more relevant than it is now. William and Kate also honored the NHS on Sunday with a special visit to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Kings Lynn. While there, the royal couple spoke with staff and volunteers to thank them for their ongoing efforts during the COVID-19 crisis. On Monday, the Queen's Commonwealth Trust shared a conversation about racial injustice that Harry and Meghan had with young leaders from around the world. This process is painful, and it has been for a long time. But through that immense pain, what we can have tremendous faith in is knowing that there will be growth. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're seeing happen every single day as all of you are out there campaigning, fighting the right fight, being on the right side of history, and ensuring that we can get closer to seeing this truly as our past and not something that we have to revisit again and again and again. During the discussion, Harry took a moment to address Britain's long history of colonialism. Certainly when you look across the Commonwealth, there's no way that we can move forward unless we acknowledge the past. It's not going to be easy, and in some cases it's not going to be comfortable, but it needs to be done because guess what? Everybody benefits. 
And finally, over the weekend, UK newspaper The Daily Telegraph published a shocking photo of Ghislaine Maxwell and actor Kevin Spacey at Buckingham Palace sitting on thrones belonging to the Queen and Prince Philip. The British publication reports that the pair were invited into the throne room on a private tour organized by Prince Andrew, who has, of course, been previously linked to Maxwell and her ex-boyfriend, convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. The photo is believed to have been taken back in 2002. Its release comes just days after Maxwell was arrested in New Hampshire by the FBI and charged for her role in the, quote, sexual exploitation and abuse of multiple minor girls by Jeffrey Epstein. Shocking news indeed. But here to help us break it all down is People's Senior Royals editor, Michelle Torber. <laughs> Michelle, so glad you're able to join us today. How are you? I'm well, thank you, Sharon. Good to see you. All right, let's dive right in. As we just mentioned on Saturday, just two days after the arrest of Ghislaine Maxwell, a British socialite and alleged accomplice of convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein, the Daily Telegraph published a photo of Maxwell and Oscar-winning actor Kevin Spacey sitting on the thrones at Buckingham Palace. And by the way, I think I should point out to our viewers, the Daily Telegraph is not a tabloid. It's very much a legitimate newspaper in London. Uh, so first off, Michelle, I want to know what went through your mind when you first saw this photograph. I know I was floored. I mean, Kevin Spacey, of all people. It was jaw-dropping to see those two people. Um, first of all, those two people together. Then you have those two people together sitting in the throne room in Buckingham Palace, in the thrones. <laughs> so that was kind of a triple whammy of really horrible and frankly shocking optics. Now, I've heard a lot of people say that this isn't, it's a throne, these are thrones, but they're not the real throne. What exactly do people mean by this? Because these are the thrones at Buckingham Palace, correct? That's right. And I think we can safely consider any thrones in Buckingham Palace to be real thrones. <laughs> these aren't just thrones at you know the the home goods store on your on the corner. So um, these are these are real thrones. However, I think what um, people are sort of um, referring to is the fact that there is indeed more than one set of thrones exist within the vast collection um, held held by the monarchy. And there is a throne that many people are familiar with from the Queen's coronation, and that actually lives at uh, Westminster Abbey. So, you know, there's not necessarily one throne, but certainly these thrones are the thrones in Buckingham Palace. They're legit thrones, let's say that. So can you tell us how a photo like this would even happen? Is it common for VIPs to get this kind of a photo op, or, or would this be considered a major breach of protocol, perhaps even be seen as disrespectful? Well, it's not common at all. And there's a reason why everyone was gasping when they saw this photo. There, there's several reasons. Um, but among them is the fact that you don't see this hardly ever, if ever, um, do we see people posing. You know, it's sort of like, you know, they were taking this like ultimate royal selfie. Um, and these are uh, chairs, thrones that would be roped off with the proverbial like, you know, red velvet rope that you're picturing in your mind. Um, they are not something that um, anyone would be expected to sit in. Um, and they are considered, you know, historic artifacts. So it's not something that would, would be in any way uh, an appropriate use of the thrones, who, regardless of who you are, unless you happen to be Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. Wow. So I'm very curious. What have you heard from your sources as far as any reaction from the palace? Officially, the palace has not had any reaction. They have not publicly commented. Behind the scenes, we expect that no one was happy at the palace, including Her Majesty. Um, obviously, as we, as we said, this is a really bad look um, for, for everyone involved, frankly. Um, and, you know, as the Telegraph reported, our understanding is that um, the visit was arranged by Prince Andrew, of course, the Queen's 
second son. Um, so he, he's the one with the access, right? So he arranged it for um, former President Bill Clinton, who at that time in 2002 was just a year out of office, was visiting on some, some business. And Bill Clinton is a friend of Kevin Spacey's. Of course, this was all before the controversy surrounding Kevin Spacey's own sex scandal. Um, and then Ghislaine Maxwell was a friend of Prince Andrew's. So it was this sort of very strange convergence of people um, that Prince Andrew was kind of the common thread um, bringing together for this very, um, very, un, you know, unfortunate, frankly, photo opportunity, which um, the paper also reported that it's not known whether Andrew was in the room when they took the photos, when they were sitting in these thrones. Um, that part hasn't been commented on at all. I was wondering if he might have been the one taking the photo. Right. I mean, I kind of had that thought too. Who who took the picture, right? Um, exactly. But it's, yeah, it's, it's not known. Okay, this next question is pure speculation, but how do you think this photograph could have wound up at the offices of the Daily Telegraph? It sure seems like someone leaked it, presumably for a hefty profit, right? Yeah, we don't know. As you say, it's speculation to, to imagine how it happened. But yes, the, the thinking is the photo was leaked and presumably by someone who is looking to embarrass um, Prince Andrew, to further embroil him in this scandal, um, to embarrass the monarchy and, and any connection that they would have had with Jeffrey Epstein, um, obviously through Prince Andrew, who, who was a friend of his. Um, so it looks to have been a leak meant to cast Prince Andrew in a very bad light. Now, since last year, the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York has been asking to speak with Prince Andrew about his relationship with uh, Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. What are you hearing about this? Do you think this is ever going to happen? Well, you know, on the Prince Andrew side of things, his legal team says he has made himself available and he is very willing to cooperate with authorities. And we're sort of hearing the exact opposite from um, the US um, district attorney who is saying, you know, oh, it's interesting to be, you know, communicated with via these public channels when privately we have not been able to set up any kind of, you know, arrange any kind of meetings um, with, with the Duke of York. So I think that it's sort of a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a he said, he said in terms of who's willing to cooperate. And um, right now it looks like things are at a bit of a standstill, but with the arrest of Ghislaine Maxwell, you know, obviously things can change on a dime. All right, thank you so much, Michelle, for helping us break down this truly shocking story. Thank you, Sharon. The Royal Report will be right back. Welcome back to the show. Joining us now is British historian, author, and television host, Lucy Worsley. Lucy, thank you so much for being here today. My total pleasure, Sharon. Thank you for having me. Great to see you. Now, Lucy, as we just mentioned, you wear many hats, but first and foremost, you're an expert in royal history. How did this become such a passion for you? Well, that's a big question. Uh -huh. <laughs> I've um, always loved history uh, ever since I was tiny. I used to read historical novels. That was my way in, as it is for a lot of people watching historical dramas. And um, that's my true passion rather than royals, I suppose. I've ended up working in Britain's historic royal palaces just because they're amazing buildings and because royals are amazingly well-documented people. So if you're a social historian, which is what I really am, then they're the best people to work on because you can find so much out. Of all the people alive at any given time, it's the royals that you're going to be able to find out most about. Now, as you mentioned, you're also the chief curator at Historic Royal Palaces, which is an independent charity that runs six of the UK's unoccupied royal palaces. For those royal fans that aren't familiar, can you tell us a little bit more about the charity and the work that you do there? Yes, we look after the royal palaces that the Queen doesn't live in anymore. Also all empty, if you like. And at different stages, they were given by the monarchy to the nation. So, the disadvantage is no Queen. The advantage is you can come in and visit. So if you're in London, you can visit the Tower of London or Hampton Court Palace or Kensington Palace, which might surprise people because you might be thinking, well, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge live there, don't they? They do, 
that the palace is cut in half and then there's all the grand space apartments that anybody, you, can come in and uh, learn about history. Yeah, Kensington Palace, definitely one of our favourites. As you said, that's the home to the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and their three kids. Uh, and part of it is unoccupied. Uh, and your team actually oversees that. So, so talk to us uh, about that job. Well, there's the, the grand rooms, just what you'd expect from a palace. Great stately interiors, long galleries, picture galleries. But then also what you come to see is our collection which includes things like the Royal Ceremonial Dress Collection, which is 10,000 pieces of costume worn by kings and queens and courtiers. And we're always putting on, well, in normal times, we're always putting on new exhibitions every year. So, so last year, the exhibition was Queen Victoria because it was Queen Victoria's 200th birthday. This year, it was supposed to be a show about royal photography, which we're going to push off into to next year, I hope, because um, at the moment, the gardens only are open because of the coronavirus situation. So it's a tough time for our charity. I, can't, I have to be honest with you, um, we, we earn all of our money from our, our visitors and our supporters. So um, we're, we're going to struggle until, until we can welcome visitors back in again. We can't wait to do that. Are there any cool royal history stories from behind those walls that you can share? Ooh, where to start, really? <laughs> one, of the, one of the really cool things we've got in our collection is a hat that's 500 years old. There's a slight argument that it may have been worn by Henry VIII. He's a very popular figure with our visitors to Hampton Court Palace. And then to fast forward 500 years, another thing that's a highlight of our collection are some of the outfits belonging to Diana, Princess of Wales, for example. So we have all of history represented. We go right back to the Normans, actually, who built the White Tower at the Tower of London, where, of course, most people come to see the crown jewels. And the instruments of torture. Don't forget the instruments of torture. They're available too. <laughs> now, what would you say is the most interesting thing uh, about Kensington Palace that surprised or perhaps even shocked you? Ooh, one of the things that a lot of people don't know about Kensington Palace is that King George II died there while on the toilet. Most oh. unfortunate. <laughs> and actually, it's a palace where there's been lots of royal deaths. William III died there, Mary II died there, but also of births. And, and perhaps the birth that intrigues me the most as a historian took place in 1819 in the dining room, curiously. And it was a little baby girl who at that point was quite low down the royal family tree. She, wasn't, she didn't seem like she was going to be very important, but she would grow up to become the mighty Queen Victoria. Something started there at Kensington Palace. That at that point, was, it had fallen from favour. It had become a, a residence for, for minor royals, if you like. And it had a sort of dilapidated, haunted house quality about it when the little girl was growing up there. And then she would sort of emerge triumphantly. Oh, on the day she became queen, when she was only 18 and three weeks. It's, it's just extraordinary to be in, in her room, her bedroom, where she woke up that morning, knowing that she was now the most powerful little girl in the world. <laughs> wow, those are some incredible stories. Now, now, royal fans can also see you on PBS this summer as the host of Lucy Worsley's Royal Myths and Secrets, a three-part series that premiered on June 21st. I absolutely loved it. For anybody who hasn't seen it yet, what can you tell us about the show and what was your favorite part of hosting yeah. it? Well, it, it, was, it was a dream project. We looked at three queens this time, Elizabeth I, Queen Anne, and Queen Marie Antoinette of France. And in each case, we tell their life story. And something I like to do is to take part in the drama myself. So I often get cast as a really nosy housemaid. Well, I know royal fans will certainly love it. And before I let you go, I want to ask you about another show you have coming up on PBS in August, all about royal family photos. Yes, what yes, can yes. you share about this one? Oh, this was such fun to make. It was supposed to tie in with the exhibition about royal photography that I mentioned that was supposed to be at Kensington Palace this summer. Come and see it next summer. Uh, it's about royals and the way that they use photography as a superpower, really. Um, I think it's such an important tool of the monarchy in Britain. They, uh, they, they no longer have absolute power, right? They have, to do, they have to really do what Parliament says. So how are they going to win power and influence? 
through soft power, if you like, by sending signals through how they act, where they go, what they wear. And it really, it's striking to me that if you are, a, you know, a browser through the media, you don't, you often don't hear the voice of the Queen. We rarely hear her speaking, but every day we see her. We see her through this medium of photography. And the, the, the first royals to use photography were Victoria and Albert 200 years ago, and they picked up that new technology and they ran with it. Uh, you know, um, just like we follow the royals on Instagram, Victoria and Albert's subjects were following Victoria and Albert through these funny little photos that you could buy, sort of about the size of a visiting card, take them home, have on your mantelpiece. And there's something about the size of these little photos that to me, it, they, just, they just seem like the pictures of the royal people that we hold in our hands now through the medium of our mobile phones. Some things don't change. So interesting. Well, I can't help but think the Duchess of Cambridge has become quite the photographer herself. I'm sure she'd love that one. Mm -hmm. All right, Lucy, thank you so much for being here and chatting royal history with us. Hope to do it again very soon. That's a total pleasure. Anytime, Sean. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. The Royal Report will be right back. Welcome back. It's time now for our Social Media Minutes. With our Social Media Correspondent, Gillian Fleischman. Gillian, how are you doing? Hi, Sharon. I'm doing great. Nice to see you. So what do you have for us today? What great post this week. Last Monday to mark what would have been the start of Holyrood Week, which is when the Queen visits Scotland and invites thousands of guests to the Palace of Holyrood, the Royal Family Instagram story took us inside the Edinburgh Palace and shared interesting facts about its history. One of its most famous residents was Mary, Queen of Scots, and visitors to the palace can still explore her bedroom and supper room. I definitely love to see those in person one day. On Tuesday, Princess Eugenie shared a video call she and her sister Princess Beatrice had with charity Teenage Cancer Trust. They spoke with young people currently receiving cancer treatment to learn how they've been coping during COVID-19. She thanked them for sharing their time and stories and called their bravery extraordinary. Love that she's highlighting such an amazing organization. Last Thursday, the Royal Family's Instagram shared photos from the recent visit by Prince Edward and Sophie Countess of Wessex to salute the NHS, which is striving to serve one million meals to NHS frontline workers. The Royals thanked all of the volunteers for their efforts and helped prepare food packages destined for workers across the UK. What a great cause. And finally, this past Saturday, the Royal Family's Instagram posted this picture of Windsor Castle's round tower turned light blue as a moment of remembrance for those who lost their lives during the pandemic. It also served as a tribute to all of those working so hard in support of the National Health Service. The NHS marked its 72nd anniversary this past Sunday, so this post couldn't have been more perfectly timed. And that's your Social Media Minute. Now, Gillian, I wanted to ask you about William and Kate's Canada Day video call, which they posted to their Kensington Royal page last Wednesday. We mentioned it in the news, of course, but I saw a lot of people talking about Kate's wardrobe. Can you tell us why what she was wearing got so much attention? Yeah, absolutely. We all know Kate puts so much thought into her wardrobe. And during this call, she's wearing red and white which are the colors of the Canadian flag. Kate loves to send a message through her clothing and her followers are usually pretty quick to pick up on it. This is another great example of her doing so and people loved her nod to Canada. Kate is always so on point. Great stuff today, Gillian. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sharon. Now it's time to bring back one of our old segments because with things finally starting to open up around the country, I think we could all use a little refresher on our royal etiquette. Hi, I'm Micah Meyer, and today we're learning the Sussex Slant. The Sussex Slant is Megan's go-to pose. She often uses it when she's sitting for a long period of time, and you can use it at home whenever you just want to stay relaxed, but look super poised. To master the Sussex Slant, all you do when sitting is keep your knees together, then cross one leg over the other. Now the key is to squeeze really tightly so your knees and ankles stay together the entire time. Note that your knees are facing so they're slanted toward one direction. Your toes are pointed forward. One foot is technically not touching the floor during this pose. 
The biggest don't for the Sussex slant is never to let your ankles come apart. So they stay really close, touching the entire time. This is Megan's take on the famous royal sitting poses. Now, it might not be the most comfortable of poses if you're shorter in stature, but she loves it because she's got long legs and can really master it. Remember, knees and ankles firmly squeezed together, and that, Royal Watchers, is the Sussex slant. That was friend of the show, Micah Meyer. Micah, thank you so much. All right, Royal Watchers, that's our show for today. Remember to follow people on Twitter to watch the latest episodes of The Royal Report, streaming every Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sharon Carpenter. Stay safe, keep calm, and carry on.